The day was October the 6th, and it was the last race of the 1974 season. The Watkins Glen had always had a hypnotic allure for Helmut Koenig, like almost every other boy who had ever dreamt of becoming something in this sport. As he stood in the paddock, his gaze swept across the undulating curves and blind corners of one of the most legendary tracks in the game. The roar of the practice sessions echoing around him with an almost perfect mechanical symphony that sent an electrifying thrill coursing through his veins. This was the real deal, and he couldn't believe he was here. Getting ready for his second Grand Prix start, he reveled in his second shot at proving himself on the biggest stage motorsports had to offer. But it went downhill from there. Helmet had a relatively run-of-the-mill life before that. Although he started like many Formula 1 drivers, he never really dreamed of competing on the track and making it big there. Born in the Styrian Mountains, he spent most of his early life skiing and then studying engineering and journalism at the college level, living and working in Sweden for quite a while. His passion for speed came later, and following this, he took the path of many drivers before him, his initiation into the world of racing being a battered Mini Cooper S, which he bought off his friend and fellow Austrian racing enthusiast, Nicky Lauda. However, while Nicky Lauda catapulted himself to fame and the thrall of the professional track, Helmut's path was much more circuitous. Going on the track, hoping to make his mark, he started by gaining the attention of Helmut Marko, who invited him to ride in a Formula V car. Even though this was his first time in a single-seater, he quickly impressed Marko and was then encouraged to drive at the Nürburgring. This was supposed to be the start of his ascent to greatness, but his gas spoon ran out and he retired briefly from the field soon after, before the season ended, choosing to continue his stint there the next season. Formula V was just the start. Soon enough, he'd raised enough money to buy a used Formula Ford, with which he contested several races in England. Showing his prowess, he came fourth in the race of champions and even won the victory meeting at the end of the circuit, beating Tony Bryce, who had dominated the British F Ford that season. He got involved in more and more races, taking each challenge as they came and aiming for the relentless pursuit of the ultimate challenge, Formula One, where he could carve his name indelibly into the plaques in the Hall of Fame. As the universe would have it, his ticket to the pinnacle of the sport eventually came when Scuderia Fenotto, a privateer team, offered him a seat at his home Grand Prix in Austria. Although he smoked out on the 31st, he received a call from John Surtees himself shortly after, offering him a chance to prove his mettle in the final two races of the season. Not many people enjoy the chance to talk to a living legend, especially after a relatively disastrous performance at the track, and Surtees was determined to make the most out of this. The chance to drive was an honour, and now he just didn't have something to prove to himself. There were watchful eyes, and he relished the chance to make them proud. The Surtees TS16 wasn't exactly the sleekest or the most powerful car on the grid, but it was his trusty chariot, his companion, his chance to prove to the stakeholders that he could put on a show and conquer the tricky corners and unforgiving asphalt of the track. His first race at the Canadian Grand Prix was on the way, and he replaced Jose Dolem, who had failed to qualify with Derek Bell at the previous Monza race. Despite initial nerves, Helmut managed to come in 11th place, establishing himself as a favourite prospect to show in the 1975 season with several teams. Things were looking up, and it seemed like there was only one way but up. In the days to come, this statement would prove to have a more morbid undertone to it. Helmut didn't know this, of course. He only then concerned himself with sealing the deal in the upcoming US Grand Prix on the 6th of October 1974. In the news, though, Helmet was a seemingly inconsequential story compared to the fact that this was the culmination of a year-long duel between McLaren's Emerson Fittipaldi and Ferrari's Clay Regazzoni. With 52 points each, they had successfully fended off Helmet's fellow Austrian, Nicky Lauda, who had retired from the previous four events and now found himself out of contention. Three of those retirements had occurred from pole position. Furthermore, South African contender Jody Schechter, though still in the running, faced a daunting seven-point gap with only nine points available. Overcoming such a margin against a single driver would be challenging. Attempting it against a pair of season top-tier racers in their prime added another layer of difficulty. Qualifying added an unexpected twist to the narrative. Carlos Reutemann, representing Argentina and driving for Brabham Ford, 
clinch pole position, flanked by the cunning and swift James Hunt of Hesketh. Strikingly, none of the title contenders fared exceptionally well in qualifying. Schechter secured a place on the outside of the third row, while Fittipaldi settled for a passive eighth, and Regazzoni occupied the ninth spot. The stage was set for a high-stakes showdown on the iconic track at Watkins Glen. The days leading up to the race were a whirlwind of activity. While most of the world held its breath for an epic showdown that would have been expected to verberate through the ages, Helmut concerned himself with practising to impress all stakeholders who had their eyes on him. Practice sessions, the endless tweaking and tuning, strategizing with his engineer, all of these were only punctuated by the foreboding of what was to come. There was pressure, there was anxiety, but the greatest sportsman knew how to handle these and Helmut was already determined to count himself amongst that number. Soon enough, the day came. Beneath the anxiety, there was a simmering excitement, a burning desire to show them all what he was capable of. This no longer was his first time on the grid. The pre-race preparations went on as usual, strapping himself into the cockpit, the leather clinging into his body like a second skin. He let the familiar weight of the helmet cover his head. The reassuring click of the visor sealed him in his own world and he let the car come alive, a beast sensing the freedom that lay beyond, hungry for release. The whine of the turbocharger, the rasp of the exhaust, he allowed himself to take note of these as he settled into the cockpit. The moment of truth had arrived. He must have known that he was no match for the Ferraris and McLarens on the field. The underfunded Surtees TS-16 hummed reassuringly and he knew how to make the most out of this. In addition to proving himself, he longed to show John Surtees, the legendary champion turned team owner, that he wasn't just another hopeful filling a backmarker's seat. Soon enough, the grid formed and Helmut glanced across his teammate, Jose Dolom, who was also having his first Grand Prix start. They were both rookies, united by youthful ambition and a shared love for the intoxicating dance of danger. They exchanged a quick nod, a silent encouragement before the storm. Moments later, the race started in a cacophony of screeching tyres and blossoming smoke, the cars pushing against the force of air and fighting their way forward, accelerating into breakneck speeds that could smash a fly into a thousand pieces. Caught in the midfield melee, Helmet managed to avoid the rest of the cars as they jousted and jostled for position, feeling his way through and wisely conceding space while looking for some to exploit at the same time. He fought his way through the pack, gaining places with every corner, the car responding well to his aggressive yet measured inputs. A sea of speeding streamlined colours, the car zipped by, the air thick with exhaust fumes, and the determination of 26 men about to embark on a high-speed dance with danger. Locked in his own world, only aiming to pass as many cars as possible, Helmet kept his eyes locked on the horizon, watching the grid take shape, and seeing the race unfold like a movie reel in his mind. The crisp October air of the Glen whipped at his helmet as he wrestled and manoeuvred the Surtees Ford TS-16 around the treacherous curbs. On the same track, just the year before, Francois Sever had perished, but that didn't matter to any of these men breezing through the grid. It was a baptism by fire for the young Austrian, only his second ever Formula 1 start. The roar of the crowd was a distant buzz, swallowed by the guttural snarl of his Surtees TS-16 and the wind whistling through his visor. His heart pounded in rhythm to the engine's growl. The Glen was an obstacle he was sworn to conquer, a roller coaster of blind corners and sweeping S's which were a far cry from the tamer tracks that he had become familiar with. His future career as a driver hinged on this one race and he sought to make sure that he established himself. By the fifth lap, he had already clawed his way into the 18th position. Though all attention was likely focused on the contenders in front, he wanted to ensure that he reached as close to them as possible. The seconds passed and he pushed harder, shaving seconds off his lap times and making the car a living extension of his will. The story would have been a fairy tale one, but sadly happy endings rarely happen in real life. The Glen was an unforgiving master and as if outraged at the thought of a rookie driver making his mark on the first try, it made sure to strike a blow. The tenth lap rolled over, and on turn seven, a treacherous hairpin notorious for its fair share of victims decided to claim one more. Ironically, Clay Regazzoni, Jean-Pierre Beltois, and Mario Andretti had been victims of this turn-at-corner practice, but they had escaped all unscathed. 
Helmet should have had as well, but extenuating circumstances seemed to work against him that day. As he reached the turn, his car suffered a suspension failure caused by the rigours of the race. The car lurched, pitching him off course. He fought for control, reflexes honed by years of racing kicking in. He slammed on the brakes while the G-forces threatened to pull him from his seat, but the car spun regardless, a hapless metal dancer pirouetting on the edge of oblivion. Whose fault was it? The driver? No, he had done everything right. The car? No, even though the suspension failed, the speed at which it headed for the Armco barrier was relatively low. The barrier loomed, a supposedly unmoving wall of steel that would have stopped the lurch with no problem. Time seemed to slow. Helmet probably braced himself for impact, anticipating the pain. Of course, the impact was far gentler than he expected. However, the car's nose crumpled against the lower section of the barrier, which was supposed to be unmoving, but was insecurely installed. Instead of absorbing the blow and bringing the car to a halt, the barrier buckled inward, leaving the upper section standing rigid like a guillotine. The car passed under the newly transformed deadly structure, and poor Helmet didn't even have a chance. It decapitated him instantly, shearing through the cockpit, a merciful yet brutal swing of the reaper's scythe, claiming the life of a man who was exploring his prospects. Luckily, it was instant. He didn't suffer longer than he had to. It would have been a joy in the sorrow if the race was to have been stopped immediately, but the cars sped by, oblivious to the tragedy that had just unfolded on the sidelines. His body and car were covered with a tarpaulin, and the race continued till the end, a hollow testament to the rentless machine that was Formula One. It wasn't until several laps later that the news reached the paddock, but immediately it reached the Surtees team. Dolan was recalled to the pits on the 26th lap, and from there they withdrew. The pre-race concerns raised by the Grand Prix Drivers Association regarding the guardrail's effectiveness seemed inconsequential now. It wasn't the time to point fingers, though ample time came for that later, so the mood after the race was relatively sombre. Recommendations had been suggested before the race, but they were either disregarded or lost in translation. It wasn't a serious issue then, but it became painfully clear to the stakeholders why it was necessary to have securely installed guardrails in a track where cars were moving at speeds that are typically illegal on commercial roads. Meanwhile, Reutemann extended his lead over Hunt until the Hesketh driver's failing engine relegated him to third, trailing behind the persistent Pache. Both Lauda and Schechter faced setbacks due to suspension and fuel pickup issues, allowing Fittipaldi to claim fourth place and secure the championship. Regazzoni, grappling with severe handling and tyre wear problems in his Ferrari, slipped down the order, ultimately finishing in 11th place. This was the second time in two years that the Watkins Glen track claimed a life. Celebrations were sombre, and understandably, Helmut's young wife, whom he had married just five months before then, was devastated. Helmut did not get to make the mark on Formula 1 that he would have loved to during his life, but because of him, safety regulations around the track were substantially expanded on. In the quiet corners of the racing world, Helmut's name is still whispered with respect and sorrow. He's remembered as the young man who dared to chase his dreams, whose life was cut short too soon, but whose sacrifice sparked a revolution in safety that has saved countless others. Thanks for watching this video and please let me know what you think in the comment section down below.